At the dawn of the 20th century, the UK was a nation divided. In 1900, Queen Victoria remained on the throne, the country was locked in the Boer War, and at home, technological and social change meant there was radical politics and industrial unrest in the air. Over the previous decades, there'd been a gradual increase in who could vote. The Liberal Party had been behind these great reform acts, even backing a handful of trade union candidates for parliamentary seats. But by the early 20th century, there was disillusion, a feeling that in a changing world, the Liberals weren't standing up for the working man. At a meeting in 1900, the trades unions banded together and formed the Labour Representation Committee, fighting to put socialists into Westminster. In effect, this was the birth of the Labour Party. Just months later, this man, Keir Hardy, became one of two MPs elected on the LRC ticket, the self-educated trade unionist becoming the fledgling party's first leader. In 1906, it changed its name to the Labour Party and won 29 seats at the general election, for the first time putting a sizeable contingent of working men into Parliament. The First World War called a temporary halt to Labour's advance. But by 1924, with millions more people now entitled to vote, Ramsay MacDonald became, albeit briefly, the first Labour Prime Minister at the head of a minority government. A second, longer stint in power five years later ended in disaster for the party. With the Great Depression biting, MacDonald agreed to form a national government with the Conservatives and Liberals, a decision that pitched Labour into infighting and marked the first of its bloody battles between the pragmatism of power and the ideals of its founders. After a decade in the wilderness, Labour, led by Clement Attlee, joined a wartime coalition in 1940. And the post-war general election gave Labour its first outright majority in the Commons, a surprise for many who thought the wartime leader, Winston Churchill, would win. Under Attlee, Labour unleashed a massive radical programme. It delivered the nationalisation of coal, electricity and the railways and created a welfare state. With its crowning glory, the National Health Service set up in 1948. But despite all that, Labour was cast from office just six years later in a remarkable reversal of fortune. Some suggest the country was simply fed up with post-war drudgery. Others that the party had become complacent, resting on its past achievements. The Conservatives, in contrast, promised an end to rationing and offered a vision of prosperity and freedom, all a sharp contrast to Labour's lingering post-war austerity. And so Labour remained in opposition until this man, Harold Wilson, who described himself as an optimist who carries a raincoat, navigated the party back to power in October 1964. Whilst his government faced turbulent economic times, under its watch, the death penalty was abolished, homosexuality and abortion were legalised and divorce was simplified. But the economic storm clouds continued to gather and darken. By the 1970s, the country was arguably ungovernable by either party. High inflation and static wages stoked industrial unrest. Two elections in 1974 failed to give Labour a convincing majority. And the country's continuing economic headaches forced the party into a year-long Lib Lab pact. Sonny Jim Callaghan took over Labour's leadership in 1976, but no one seemed able to stop the spiral of decline and the crippling winter of discontent when rubbish piled up on the streets and bodies went unburied, put an end to Labour's torrid spell in office. From their central London HQ, the Conservatives, led by Margaret Thatcher, filled the void with a radical programme. Home ownership, a sweep of privatisations and a curb on trade unions. And by 1979, the country was ready for change. But few could have predicted it would be 18 long years before the party had broad enough appeal to put a Labour Prime Minister back into Downing Street. The party had initially moved to the left under Michael Foote, leading to a split and the creation of the Social Democratic Party. We offer not only a new party, although it is that, but a new approach to politics. Determined to stick to the principles of socialism, Foote's 83 manifesto was famously dubbed the longest suicide note in history. And the party's crushing defeat marked a turning point. 
Under new leader Neil Kinnock, it began to slowly claw its way back to power. Kinnock took on the far left and began to change the party's image. I'm telling you, you can't play politics with people's jobs and with people's services. Out went the red flag, in came the red rose. But there was still a long way to go. Two more election defeats meant another new leader, John Smith, and more treasured ideas being cast aside. The ascendance of Tony Blair in 1994 set the seal on the new Labour era. Treasured policies such as nationalisation, nuclear disarmament and high taxes were consigned to the dustbin. And Blair stamped his authority on the party, abolishing the totemic Clause 4, the pledge printed on the back of every membership card declaring the common ownership of the means of production, distribution and exchange. By the end of the 20th century, the party of collectivism and the poor had abandoned much of its radicalism, embracing focus groups, PR and spin. Tony Blair swept to power, staying in number 10 for a decade. But Tony Blair's government was a long way from some of the party's founding principles. Some supporters struggle with the concepts of free markets in health, education and transport. But they had little choice than to swallow the medicine they found so bitter. By 2007, Labour seemed tired, worn out by the personal infighting of the two men at the top. Yeah, Gordon, it's not often a chance to get something. <laughs> not often to get something for free. So. Labour diehards were disillusioned by the compromises they had to make under Tony Blair, and the divisions with the Chancellor Gordon Brown supporters were as ideological as they were personal. The eventual transfer of power from Blair to Brown failed to reinvigorate the party, and his defeat, after three scant years in office, sent the party back to opposition to lick its wounds. But after the era of modernisation, how much had really changed? It was, after all, the trades unions who were credited with ensuring it was the more left-leaning Ed Miliband who snatched the Labour leadership from his Blairite brother David. Ed Miliband now leads a party that's held power for some 30 years out of its 100-plus year history. But he faces a familiar battle between political idealism and the pragmatism of power. How can Labour hold on to its core supporters, the poor, the trade unions and the dispossessed, and reach out to Middle England with all its aspirations? It's a question many of his predecessors have found difficult to answer.